We shall now turn to the chapter which we read, Luke chapter 18, our text for this evening is verse 1. Luke 18, verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. I wonder, are you tempted to faint? Do you feel like giving up? Do you feel a sense of despair sometimes coming over you? The Christian life can be very hard. The devil is very subtle and very determined to distract, to tempt to seduce, to destroy. The Bible demands so much from us. The standard is so high that sometimes we say, I'd like to run away. I'd just like to hide. I can't do it. I can't go on. Oh, that I, like a dove, had wings, said I, then would I flee far hence, that I might find a place where I in rest might be. The psalmist felt like that, didn't he? He just longed that he had the the wings of a dove so that he would fly away from all the troubles and the difficulties and the problems and the pressures and the anxieties. Away into the desert. Away from all the strife and all the turmoil and all the stresses and the pressures and the temptations. And of course, it's always been a temptation to run away, hasn't it? In the old church, the ancient church, they they had hermits who ran away from other people and went to live in caves. Then they had monasteries, again, and nunneries, convents, where people would get away to be at peace with God. Well, that was the idea. But of course it didn't work. Because the trouble is, you go away. You go away to a quiet cave somewhere, far, far away. But what do you take with you? Your own heart. Your own sinful imagination. And of course the devil's there too. You can't get away. And the only escape is when death comes. And the Lord takes us to heaven. But is that the only escape? No, it's not. There is another escape. And what is that other escape? Where is that other hiding place? It's prayer. Thou art mine hiding place. Thou shalt from trouble set me free. That is God. And we run to him. And how do we run to him? In prayer. Remember how Paul put it in Philippians. And in chapter 4. Be careful for nothing. Oh, the cares and the worries and the anxieties and the troubles. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. There's the way. Prayer. And when you go and pray you find that you enter into a place where the peace of God surrounds you. Keeps your heart and mind. Cast your burden on the Lord. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I sometimes feel it myself very much. The pressures, the weakness, the frailty, the stresses, the temptations, the difficulties, the obligations, the duties, and all these things pushing in, crushing in. And there's this desire to just escape from it all. A desire to die and be gone. And yet that's wrong. 
We mustn't run away from the place of duty. God says, I called you. I put you there. You have a duty. You have a responsibility. You must go. You must live. You must serve. You must do my work. And when you have done it, I will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. But if you only do half the work, God's not going to say, well done. You've abandoned the place of duty. And you've left the port of responsibility. Stay. Do my work. Where is your refuge then? Men ought always to pray and not to be. Two opposites. Pray and faint. So which one will you have today? Pray or faint. Give up or call upon the name of the Lord who is mighty to save. Well, first tonight, tempted to faint. We're all tempted to faint. We're tempted to faint because of different things. Some of you, it might be stress at your work. That can be very hard to bear. Different pressures, feeling you're not managing. <coughs> Managers that demand too much from you. (coughs) Difficult people to work with. Then there's pressures at home. Pressures with husbands, wives, families, parents. Sick people dependent upon you. Little children wanting to be looked after. All these pressures coming upon you. And you feel sometimes your age. And you feel sometimes... That is too much for you. and People are demanding and demanding. and You think you can't manage. And maybe, too, there's stress in the church. And people are looking for you to do this, to do that, to do the next thing. And it seems it's never ending. And it's always demands. People demanding from you. Not just people. But what's even more difficult is God demanding things of you. And your conscience is bothering you. And you feel you should be doing this, and you should be doing that, and you should be doing the next thing. And the week is too short. And your strength is too limited. And you feel your gifts are not sufficient for it. And how can I cope? And all these pressures, and God is making demands upon you, and you say, Lord, I just give up. I can't go on. It's too much. How can I go through with it? Think of even the pressures in your own Christian life. God says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. How can I? Who is able? Perfect. But I'm so far from it. And yet that's what God demands. Be perfect. He says, Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. But how can I deny myself? How can I take up my cross? The cross is painful. I cannot bear it. I want to run away from it. He says, love those that hurt you. Bless those that persecute you. Do good to those who despitefully use you. Turn the other cheek to the one who hits you. Who can do that? And yet you must. Love your enemy, and you must. And when people criticize you, and mock you, and ridicule you, and despise you, you must love them. And you must pray for them. And you must be kind to them. And you must not retaliate. And you must not be bad-tempered. But it's so natural to fight back. It's so natural to get your own back on people. It's so natural to lose your temper. I mean, I think I've got every right to lose my temper. And you have no right to lose your temper. Love 
the pressure. It's so much. And Christ says, take a towel and wash the disciples' feet. Take the lowest place. Be a servant to others. Be a doormat for other people to walk over. I can't be a doormat. I've got my rights. And I've got my pride. And I'm not going to be a doormat. And I'm not going to have people mock me and ridicule me and trample on me and misuse me. And the old nature rises up in aggression. And I want, I want to be somebody and I want to be special and I want me to be respected by others. And we're tempted to faint. And Christ says to us, Men ought always to pray and not to faint. It's very difficult in the midst of weakness and pain and suffering. How can I bear with this? Why is the Lord allowing this to happen? I pray and nothing happens. I remember a man telling me he was suffering from a very serious illness. Since then, he's got better. But at that time, sometimes he and his wife would set apart a day for special prayer. And it seemed that it only got worse. He prayed, and yet his illness got worse. And his weakness was worse, and his symptoms were more pressing. How is it, Lord? Why? Why am I in this pain? Why am I in this discomfort? Why this weakness? Why this affliction? Do you not love me, Lord? Did you not say, I have loved you with an everlasting love? Did not the Lord Jesus die for me on the cross? Am I not one of the elect of God? Am I not on my way to heaven? Why then is it that I have to go through this dark valley of distress and this, 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 this pain and this weakness? And even when I pray, it only gets worse. May not always to pray. And sometimes the prayer is not answered today. And it's not answered tomorrow. And it's not answered next week. And it's not answered next month. And it's not answered next year. But maybe it's the year after. And the Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. But there's so many sad things in my life. How can I be happy when I'm lonely? How can I be happy when my loved one has been taken from me? How can I be happy when nobody seems to care about me? How can I be happy when God doesn't seem to answer my prayer? And the Bible says, rejoice in the Lord, always. And again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. It's all very well for other people to rejoice, but do you know what I'm going through? And do you know my difficulties? And do you know my anxieties and my worries and my stresses and my pressures and my pains and my problems? Rejoice! How can I rejoice? I would be a fool to rejoice. And yet the Bible says rejoice. But it's not rejoice in your circumstances. And it's not rejoice in your achievements. And it's not rejoice in your righteousness. But it's rejoice in the Lord. The Lord who has the answer. And the Lord who is working out all things for the best. The end of chapter 17, we read about the end of the world. What a terrible time. The Pharisees demand when the kingdom of God shall come. And he says, 
It will not be with observation. These days will come and you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and shall not see. Ah, yes. You long to see a day of the Son of Man. What's a day of the Son of Man? A day of His power. A day of His glory. A day of His salvation. A day of sinners being saved. A day of revival, a day when Glasgow will flourish, a day when Scotland will blossom, a day when the desert will be changed into a garden, a day when the world will sing the praises of the Lord and when the kingdom of Christ will conquer. We long to see a day of the right hand of the Most High, a day of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. And yet you are to pray and not faint. For as the lightning lighteneth one part of the heaven, shineth unto another part of the heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. The coming of the Son of Man, so unexpected, so surprising. When that day comes, one, two shall be in a bed, one taken, the other left. Two women grinding together, one shall be taken and the other left. Two men in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. Difficult days, trying days, terrible days, frightening days. Days when they shall call upon the mountains to fall upon them and the hills and the rocks to cover them from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne. May not always to pray. And not faint. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. In the midst of days of gospel blessing and prosperity. Keep on praying in the days of gospel. Death. And darkness and decay. Keep on praying when Satan seems triumphant. Keep on praying. For your redemption. draws nigh. Tempted to faint. You know what it is to be tempted to faint. I'm sure you all do in different ways. Tempted to give up. Tempted to despair. Tempted to be angry with God. Why, Lord? Why this? Why that? Why this suffering? Why this pain? Why this grief? Why this sorrow? Tempted to faint. Well, Secondly, notice the answer. Men ought always to pray. Cast your burden on the Lord. Tell him everything. Give thanks for the past and plead for the future. Men ought always to pray. In the midst of all the difficulties, wondering what am I to do today? How am I to conduct myself in this situation? What am I to say? What decision am I to take? May not always to pray. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Seek wisdom. God gives wisdom. May not always to pray when you're feeling weak and frail and helpless and hopeless and you can't go on, you can't make another step. Pray for strength. May not always to pray for strength. When the devil's got the better of you and you've sinned and you're ashamed of yourself and you don't feel like even praying and you cannot lift up your head to heaven because you're so disgraced in the presence of your heavenly Father that you've once again defiled yourself in that horrible way. They ought always to pray and not to be. The answer to sin is always to return to the Lord. It's never to stay away. Come. Come with a broken and a contrite heart. Come with a confession of sin. Come with your filthy hands and your filthy mouth. 
and your filthy heart. Come to the one who can clean you. May not always to pray and not to faint. As you think about the cause in our own day, as you think about the weakness of the church, as you think about how few we are, how the cause is so feeble in Scotland. And over these last hundred and fifty years, it seems that it has been going from weakness to weakness. My own over 30 years in the ministry has been a time when I have seen the church get so much weaker in Scotland. What is the answer? Give up. Despair. Call it a day. Run away and hide. No. Men ought always to pray and not to fail. To pray for strength, to pray for courage, to pray for zeal, to pray for the Holy Spirit, to pray for sinners to be converted, to pray for Christians to be enlivened, to pray for revival, to pray for a day of the right hand of God. Pray for what seems impossible. Think of Elijah. He lived in a day when idolatry was rampant and the Queen Jezebel was using all her power to weed out the true religion from Israel and to substitute it with Baal worship. And what did Elijah do? He prayed. And what did he pray for? He prayed that the rain would stop. That there would be no rain on Israel. He prayed for judgment. Terrible thing to pray for. He prayed for a famine. How dare he pray for a famine? What a terrible thing to pray for. We have seen famine in some parts of the world. Would you like to see a famine in Britain? I've heard people say that two world wars didn't bring Britain to its knees, but a famine would bring Britain to its knees. Well, I don't know are they prophets or are they not. But Elijah prayed for a famine. And that famine brought Israel to its knees. For three and a half years, there was no rain. There was no rain. And in the end, the king and all the people were ready to gather on Mount Carmel. And to meet with God there. And then we're told that Elijah prayed for rain. Now, was it an easy thing for Elijah to pray for rain? No, we're told that he got down on his knees. And he didn't just get down on his knees, but he put his head between his knees. His whole body contorted, as it were. You can see body and mind and soul and agony pleading with the Lord. Send the rain, send the rain, Lord. He asked his servant to go up the hill and see if rain was coming. The servant said, no. He prayed again. Send the rain. Send the servant up the hill. Still no sound of rain. He had to pray and pray and pray and not faint, but keep praying with his head between his knees, pleading with the Lord. And after he had done that seven times, there appeared a cloud as a man's hand in the west. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. And soon there was the sound of abundance of rain. Yes, the Lord hears, hears prayer. Think of Christ praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed with strong crying and tears unto him who was able to deliver him from death. And he was heard in that he feared. 
What a prayer. The sweat falling from his brow was red with blood. And how was he heard? Well, he was heard in that an angel was sent to comfort him. And he was heard in that he was sustained so that he was able to cry. Later on that day, it is finished. I've done it. And he was heard in that he was raised from the dead. After three days, he was heard. He prayed and he didn't faint. But he must have been within a whisker of fate. Let this cup pass from me. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken? Oh, how close he was to despair. But men ought always to pray and not to faint. And Christ said before us, the example. The Apostle Paul himself was grieved with the thorn in the flesh. And he prayed that the thorn would be removed and it wasn't. And he prayed again more earnestly that it would be removed and it wasn't. And he prayed the third time, Lord, take this thorn away. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. Men ought always to pray, and one thing you can be sure of, in answer to prayer, comes grace. There's always a positive outcome to prayer. You might not get what you want. But God's grace will enable you to go on without fainting. The answer to fainting is prayer. And if you pray, you won't faint. Pray. Pray without ceasing. Remember what Paul said on another occasion. There is no temptation, he said, befallen us, but such as is common to man. But he will also, with the temptation, make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. So maybe you're here tonight, and maybe you're in a situation in which you feel there's no way out. And it's strange how Christians find themselves sometimes in that situation. And sometimes Christians even take away their own life. I was saddened when I was up in Stornoway recently to hear of an elder in the church up there who just recently took away his own life. What was the problem? Well, there was a lot of mental illness there. And I'm sure that is a big fact. But whether mental illness or whatever it is, what does the scripture say? Men ought always to pray and not to pray. And however hard your situation is, never, never, never put a hand to your own life. Men ought always to pray. And there is a way out. There is. The Lord says it. However hard the temptation, God with a temptation will make a way of escape so that you might be able to be it. There's always a way out. They are not always to pray and not to faint. That leads us then thirdly to notice here the widow's reward. He tells, Jesus tells a parable about a widow, a widow who was friendless. She had nobody to help her. 
She had no money and she had no influence. And something terrible had happened. We're not told what it was. Maybe she had been robbed. Or maybe she had been defrauded of her inheritance. Or maybe somebody had stolen from her her land. Or maybe her house was taken from her. Something terrible had happened. And as her last resort, she goes to see the judge. And she had a good case. But the judge feared not God, nor respected man. He was a wicked judge, and he accepted bribes. It's a terrible thing if you have to deal with a judge who accepts bribes. The person who has wronged you pays the judge a bribe. And you, what can you do? Here's this woman. She's got no money to pay a bribe. And it's immoral anyway to pay a bribe. And there she is, confronted with the unjust judge. She tells her case, and he says, go on. Not interested. He will not help her. So what does she do? She keeps coming. And she comes, and she comes. She comes on Monday. He sends her away. She's back on Tuesday. He sends her away. Wednesday morning, there she is in the court again. He sends her away. Thursday. As he's coming to work, who does he see there standing at the court? And the judge is but the wind. Friday, she's there again. Next Monday morning, the widow's there. He shakes his head. But as the time goes by, he realizes it's no use. Though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. She was making the judge's life a misery for him by constantly coming, pleading, 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 pleading. And so the unjust judge gave her what she requested. He gave her justice. Now, think of the great judge in heaven. What a contrast. On the one hand, an unjust judge, and then the judge in heaven. He is so just, and he never does anything but what is just. Come to him with your prayers, and you'll get justice from him. The unjust judge required a bribe. The God of heaven will accept no bribes. Come to him, you'll get justice. The unjust judge cared not for man, and didn't care a hoot for this wedding. But the judge in heaven loves you and loves you with an everlasting love. How you ought to come to him and present your case before him. The unjust judge couldn't care less for you and would happily give you nothing. The judge in heaven he gives you the very best. He pours down upon you Blessing upon blessing. His mercies are new every morning. Great indeed is his faithfulness. Good unto all men is the Lord. O'er all his works his mercy is. Furthermore, the unjust judge waited until he was forced to give to this widow what she required. Shall not God avenge his own elect speedily? Of course he will. He never waits too long. He never lets the opportunity pass, the appropriate moment. There's no needless delay. Come to him. Pour out your heart to him. Remember, all works for good. He is Concerned for your very best, persist 
the greater the pressure upon you, the more you must pray. Men ought always to pray and not to think. But then, finally, one final searching question. Verse 8. I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? What's the answer? When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Look at the churches, see them decline, aging, dividing, weak theologically, weak in practice, weak in discipline, weak in worship, weak in evangelism. See the superficial Christians, see all the hypocrites in the church. Satan says there's no future for the church. When the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? Yes, he certainly will. While sun and moon endure, he have his witnesses. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Pray to him, look to him, trust in him, cast the church upon him and the future of the church. Yes, when the Son of Man comes, he will find faith on the earth. But then, take this question personally. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in your heart? It's a question, isn't it? If the Son of Man comes tonight, will he find faith in your heart? Are you fainting or are you saved? If the Son of Man comes tonight, will he find faith on you? Are you trusting in him? Are you looking to him? Are you depending upon him? Oh, you say, I've prayed to him and he's never answered me. They not always to pray and not to say, never give up, never despair, never say he will not answer. Keep coming to him, keep looking to him. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in your heart? Well, that's a question for you to answer. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you serve Baal? Or will you serve God? Will you serve the world? Or will you serve Christ? The world tempts us. The devil seduces us. Many fall away. The love of many waxes cold. But what about you? Where do you stand tonight? Men ought always to pray and not to think. And if you always pray, when the Son of Man comes, you'll find faith on the earth and in your heart. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't despair.